Today's story features yet another tax collector. You're hearing a lot about these guys lately. This time we get a name, actually, Zacchaeus, which is not the easiest name to type over and over again in Word. And not only is he a tax collector, he's a chief tax collector. So he's the boss, so to speak. Now, as I explained last week, Tax collecting was an independent contractor type business. Whoever promised to collect the most would get the job, and often the collectors would skim off the top for themselves. This was what was expected by the people, and the people generally hated the tax collectors. Another aspect of this hatred stems from the fact that the taxes were going to Rome And these tax collectors were generally Jewish people collecting money from fellow Jewish people in order to pay Rome, the empire that they didn't like very much that was oppressing them. Therefore, the tax collectors were hated, and we have also been conditioned to hate them too. But Jesus has a way of kind of flipping things around on us, doesn't he? Now, traditionally, when we read this passage, we interpret it as Zacchaeus sees Jesus, is converted, and then promises to change his ways. The translation that we have in our book says, Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. He says, I will give to the poor. I will pay people back. With this translation, the interpretation of Zacchaeus being converted and then promising to do better is apt. But there's a hitch here that was pointed out by just about every one of my resources that I looked at this week. According to my research, in the original Greek text, of Zacchaeus's declaration. It's written in the present tense, not the future tense. So this kind of changes things if we look at it differently. So let's step back a second. If this is a traditional redemption story, we would expect some kind of repentance first, right? That's usually how it goes. Repent, then you promise to change. But Zacchaeus does no such thing. He climbs a tree so that he can see Jesus. And then Jesus sees him and invites himself back to Zacchaeus' house. We'll get back to that part a little later. Only after the crowd grumbles, which the crowd loves to do, does Zacchaeus offer up his statement that he gives to the poor and he repays what he stole. So if we read it in the present tense, it means he's already been giving to the poor, and he already pays people back fourfold. It seems like he's defending himself against the nasty crowd. And uh, David Lowe's wrote this week, I suspect that Zacchaeus is not turning over a new leaf as much as he's lifting up an old one for all to see. So if this story is not about repenting and promising to do better, what can we learn from it? Let's focus on the crowd. They hate Zacchaeus. He's rich. He takes their money. But other than that, they really don't know anything about him, do they? They assume that he's a bad person. Now remember, Jesus never condemns wealth in and of itself. No, it's the love of money that is the root of all evil. And it's not that rich people have money that is bad. Rather, it is what they do with it. If you think back a few weeks ago, or however long ago, in Luke, we read about Lazarus and the rich man. The rich man doesn't suffer hellfire for being rich. His sin was that he was indifferent towards the suffering of Lazarus. He saw Lazarus every single day and knew his name 
but just walked past him and ignored him. That was the problem. Now the crowd today assumes that since Zacchaeus is rich, he is bad, when they really don't have any way of knowing that, do they? Because Jesus came to minister to all people, the poor, the rich, the needy, and the outcast especially. Now in today's story, Zacchaeus is the outcast. He's been shunned by his own people, but Jesus welcomes him into the flock. All the people want to see Jesus, but then Jesus sees them back. We, as the crowd, don't get to decide who gets to see Jesus and who gets what from God. The crowd has assumptions about how rich people are and what they do, but then Jesus flips it over on them, as he does very often. Zacchaeus was labeled as a sinner by the crowd, but was he really? No, Jesus instead declares that he too is a son of Abraham. Because what we see of people in our day-to-day -day lives is just the surface. We can never tell what's going on underneath. Only God does. And there is no one mold of person who's welcome in the kingdom of God. Now Zacchaeus sought Jesus out. He climbed a tree which is very improper for someone of his wealth, in order to see Jesus. And in the reading of this text, Zacchaeus has already done the hard work of repenting, and now he seeks to meet Jesus on a personal level. And you know what? Jesus sees him too, and calls him by his name, and goes to his home, and blesses his whole family. Jesus sees Zacchaeus' good works and blesses him, even if the crowd doesn't. Now, the kingdom of God is not reserved for just one kind of person. That would be a very boring place to be anyway, I think, if everyone was the same. So just when you think you have someone figured out, you know, they might surprise you, like in the story today. We can never know how God is working in someone else's life, just our own. And however rich or poor you are is of no matter to God. How you use whatever you have for the good of the world and how you live your life for the good of the world is what matters to God. All different types of people can live good lives for God. And when they do, they're all truly welcome into the kingdom. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.